Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Meditation with Raphael podcast. I am your host, and I am so glad and honored to have you with us today. Today, I'm going to share with you the last part on these lectures that I did in my course regarding thoughts in meditation and consciousness, different states of consciousness. And today, we're going to be dealing with thoughts in two parts. The first one is going to be dealing with thoughts in your meditation practice, what you should do with these thoughts when you meditate. Are they good? Are they bad? This is what we're going to be talking about. And in the second part, we're going to specifically talk about sticky thoughts, these thoughts that are really hard to put aside, to simply observe without an emotional or any kind of attachment. Okay, so I'm very happy to share these with you. And while I'm here, I just want to say that during this Black Friday week, which is not something that I particularly like, to be honest, it's always pushing for consumerism. And it's not something that I, I, uh, I'm really into. But I did want to take the opportunity to give you uh, a gift for uh, preparing the new year or for ending the old year, if you prefer, with a 70% discount on my meditation course. 70% discount. You just have to follow the links in the show description. And actually, that's it. So enjoy this lecture. I hope it's useful for you. If you have any questions or any feedback, you know where to reach me. It's all in the show notes. And I'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye bye. From experience, I can say that one of the biggest misconceptions about meditation is that it's about eliminating thoughts. That is not true. Not entirely true. It's not true. Not entirely true. It's not entirely true. When I first started meditating, the first time I tried meditation, we'll say, I was a young child. And I was told precisely that meditation is a practice where you have to concentrate hard enough on eliminating all the thoughts in your head so that you can have some sort of peace or relaxation. I'm not, I don't remember what I was told. And so I tried once and of course I felt miserably. I tried a second time, even harder, you know, putting this hard focus. I failed. I did it a third time, this time really thinking, okay, I must do it. I'm like a Jedi and I failed and I failed again. And then after a few times, probably less than what I've just said, I gave up. It was too hard. I was not smart enough to stop these thoughts. I didn't have the strength, the, the mind strength. Maybe I was too young, maybe I was too weak. Maybe my focus and concentration was subpar. I've always had difficulties focusing well for long periods of time. I was not, I was not bad at school. I was a good school student. I worked as little as possible. I did the exact minimum of what I had to do. But I was able to work really fast and that enabled me to have relatively okay results, good results for for the minimum of working. And this is also because I couldn't, I just could not sit there for more than five minutes or 10 minutes to do some exercises or whatever I had to do. And as I've contemplated on my youth more recently, I can see that I had a flagrant symptoms, a flagrant symptoms of ADHD right up to my adult years, not just when I was a child. And although now I've been better at focusing and concentrating in big part thanks to my meditation protocols, I still do have some moments where it's not easy for me to sit and concentrate long periods of times. Usually, I mean, it's easier when it's something that I'm really passionate about, but I'm not going to digress into ADHD. I know it's a subject that a lot of people want to talk about, but maybe at a different time. But this is important because it, it kind of shows my approach to things here. So at the time, I was not diagnosed uh, with ADHD. I guess it wasn't so fashionable back then. I don't know. I did grow up pretty much alone. So my parents didn't have, I mean, my parent didn't have any idea of what I was doing or any schoolwork or anything like this. I didn't have to report to anybody you know. So I was left undiagnosed, but I, I really think that I did have that. And I didn't try meditation for a long time after those first few times because it was not comfortable, because I, I never felt I, I was 
adequate enough to do it because I was not able to focus. I was not able to concentrate. I was not able to sit without any thoughts. And not only could I not concentrate or focus for more than a few minutes, I didn't have the mental strength and capacity to stop my thoughts. So I think this went also into the area of self-confidence and things like this. I honestly don't remember who told me to sit and focus on eliminating my thoughts. And to this day, people come to me telling me that they tried meditation for a long time but gave up because they failed, because it was too hard. It was so hard. It was really, really, really hard. They couldn't focus enough and they couldn't get rid of their thoughts. So let us start here. I think it's a good point of start when to, you know, to speak about thoughts. And meditation is not, <laughs> as I've later found out, and as we can talk about here, meditation is not about actively emanating the thoughts. In fact, it is not about actively anything. Meditation is not an active thing. It is a practice, as we saw in week one, where we need to adopt a passive attitude. Whatever happens, happens, and we sit back and enjoy the show. Meditation is not about eliminating thoughts, but it helps to slow down the stream of these thoughts. Instead of being mindlessly bombarded by a million thoughts per minute without any control over them, simply by relaxing the body, settling the mind on our meditation object, whether it's the breath or a mantra or a vibration, the thoughts start to slow down by themselves. When they slow down, they become more clear. We can not only observe them, we can then quite literally meditate on them. We can contemplate their meaning, their consistency. We can start seeing what feelings they carry with them. Little by little, as we enter our natural meditative state, we're able to see thoughts as small individual entities linked by a very thin skin, one by one, one after another. And so... The amount of thoughts that appear on the foreground of our mind slow down in an effortless procedure and we're able to step back, calm down, relax. Thoughts are not bad for our meditation. Thoughts are an integral process of our meditation. We cannot meditate without thoughts. If we did, we'd be asleep, in a deep sleep. We do not judge the thoughts. You heard me say that in every single one of the guided meditations I do. Why is this so important? It's really, really important. It's important because this would be engaging the ego precisely at a time where we're trying to transcend it. Engaging the ego means that new, not necessarily objective, flows of thoughts will start to pour in automatically, without limits. When we judge our thoughts, we compare them to other thoughts. This is how judgment and opinion works. It has an object of comparison, of opposition. It doesn't mean it represents some perfect duality of thoughts with yin thoughts and yang thoughts, because it can compare to many different thoughts, some of these thoughts being conditional hypothetical thoughts. Thoughts about the future, thoughts about what could have happened, what should have happened, what might have happened if this other array of conditional thoughts might have been true for a future that doesn't exist. Maybe you don't understand what I'm saying because I'm talking in chaos. As I listen to myself while editing, I didn't understand a word that I just said. And this is precisely what happens when we judge our thoughts. We lose awareness, we lose clarity, we lose focus, we lose perceptions, and our minds become blurry and foggy and tired. The mind becomes weak because it is overburdened, it is overstressed, it develops unease, it develops disease. As we explained before, there is no true joy in life that is lived by or interpreted by an unhealthy mind. And so, we don't judge our thoughts because this is how we become nuts, <laughs> for lack of a better term. I could have resumed all this blah blah with this one unique sentence. We don't judge our thoughts because this is how we become nuts. Where do thoughts come from? From where does consciousness originate? There are some theories that I like to believe in. There are some ideas about the source of thought that I feel strongly enthusiastic about. But those thoughts, those ideas, are theories that are not proven. They are not even entirely objective. They are not an expression of truth nor of reality. As we said, 
at the very beginning of the series of lectures. I know that in the past, I have been guilty of expressing my opinion on these subjects. And I'm not saying that I'm not allowed to express my opinion on anything that I would like, to be honest. I am. But expressing my opinions to you on my theories of the origin of thought can jeopardize your journey of discovery. I don't want to hand out fish that might actually be chicken or turkey or tofu turkey tur for tur 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 turkey. I want to help you build a net or a fishing rod and show you how I fish so that you can do the same and then Maybe we catch the same fish, maybe we don't. Maybe we catch something different, maybe we catch a shoe. Maybe we catch something and we think that we should cook it differently, on the grill, in the sauce, or like sushi. Maybe we all catch the same fish and have the same taste in cooking, so we do exactly the same with the same sauce, the same heat, and so on. Same side dishes, that's possible. But remember Krishnamurti, who said something along the lines of, it is no measure of health, to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And so, even if we catch the same fish using the same technique and cook it in the same way and agree on everything on the right wine for that dish, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that it is the truth. It does not mean that it is the truth. It's not because we all believe the same thing that this is reality. This is not the way we prove reality. Yes, you will find books and videos on people that have explained the truth to you. You will find scientists. And Egwene, I'm doing these air quotes in front of my mic. <clears throat> It's not working. Uh, you will find scientists that say this and that. They might be good sources. But then there are other good scientists and other thinkers and other holders of different truth with other good sources that can be just as convincing. Too many truths to count. This is not a subject where we need the truth because the truth doesn't exist. And the truth is totally useless. It is the pursuit of the truth, not the pursuit of the truth, the discovery, the experience that counts and that will enhance the quality of your life. Again, it's all about the process, remember, we talked about this at the very beginning of the course. It's about the process without the outcome, you know, as a goal. So, where do thoughts come from? Where is the source? What does the source look like, feel like? What does it contain? And what is the point of you paying your hard-earned money for a course that contains no answer? Well, it's all about the fishing rod, isn't it? Or the fishing net. This is what we should focus on, isn't it? Yes, that fishing rod is indeed the meditation techniques and processes that we're learning here. are such an important part in our meditation, what is the difference between thinking and meditation? That's a very good question. I guess that the first thing that can distinguish the two is that when we practice meditation, we start having a more clear separation between the thoughts and what really defines who we are. We get to have a glimpse of reality as opposed to ego-filtered or thought-filtered reality that we would have in the more usual process of thinking. There is also in meditation a detachment that is slowly created in the way that these thoughts affect us emotionally. Once we start seeing these thoughts as entities of their own and we really dig deep into their core, we materialize them in a way that we start to understand that the thought of who we are and who we really are is a very different way. When we start building awareness to what thought really is the thought doesn't affect us anymore think about it this way if you had a feeling of sadness and you were to go into meditation you would start to be aware of that emotion in such a way that you're not sad anymore because the sadness doesn't belong to you you know it is separated from you this is the way i often do when I get a sticky thought, even with years of experience in meditation, we get these sticky thoughts and feelings and emotions during our practice. What I mean with sticky thoughts is that thought that just doesn't want to get in the background of your mind for some reason. 
and you find it very difficult to go back to your meditation object, whatever that object may be, in our case, the vibration, the sound. You try to get back to the sound calmly, effortlessly, but it just won't budge. That's totally fine. It happens. That's totally okay. Don't worry. Don't panic. The first step is to practice realizing that this is also part of the meditation, that it happens and that it's perfectly okay that it happens. This is really, really, really important. Listen again. The first step is to practice realizing that this is part of the meditation, that it happens and that it's perfectly okay that it happens. Okay, this is really important because we need that passive attitude. If we get frustrated, we start to judge ourselves. We start to judge the meditation process, the meditation, the meditator, me, the guide of the meditation. And you judge the thought. Your mind gets clouded in an overflowing abundance of threads, threads of thoughts, arrays of thoughts, as we explained earlier. So that's the first step. You step back. Take a passive approach. Seneca has said, nothing should ever be unexpected by us. And this is a core principle of Stoicism. Nothing should ever be unexpected by us. That doesn't mean that you can predict the future. Okay, it doesn't mean that you can predict the future. It simply means that the reactions you might have to events should never be unexpected. It's the reactions you might have to the events that should never be unexpected. This is what you train through meditation, through philosophy. At least that's my way of interpreting this quote. Maybe there are different interpretations. But in the month that come, you might even create a tool a tool of words, a set of words and phrases that will help you through that whole process. This will be personal to you. And it is a very, very important part of your tool set for meditation. So for example, just to explain better, when you get a sticky thought, you might start by saying in your mind, hello, sticky thought, how are you today? You, <laughs> you stay polite, you stay cool. You don't engage in some sort of conflict. You know, don't engage in... How can I say? Yeah, yeah, don't engage in conflict. Treat that sticky thought like a small child or an employee <laughs> a subordinate that has HR on speed dial, you know? But, or like yeah, like a small child. Or like a deer hunter. I, I don't I don't hunt, but I can imagine, you know, like in a cartoon. Don't scare it or burst and leave behind some really stinky smell. Nice, calm, smooth voice. Hello, sticky thought. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your presence. Maybe you can have some sort of a, of a voice like at the airport, you know, or customer service. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presence. Do you need some love? Do you need some attention? You're trying to tell me something? Come, let's sit for a few minutes together. And that is step one. Make the f thought comfortable. Make the thought feel cared for in this, and make it feel safe so that it doesn't stay Stink your mind when it explodes. <laughs> okay, so very carefully. Hello, thought. Next step, and and I'm uh, I'm being a little bit facetious and playing around, but I'm very very serious in this process. The next step is, well, as you promised it, to give it your full attention. That sticky thought is the only thought. Dig into it. What is it telling you? With what voice? Your usual inside voice or something else, something a little bit different? What tone? What tone of what is the music of that thought? Where is it located? In your body? Outside your body? Where exactly in your body? In your solar plexus? Okay, what does it feel like? What is it what it's what is it what is its temperature? What is its texture? What is its color? What is its shape, form? You know, really get into the details of it. And by the way, by creating, by giving this thought or full attention you've actually created a really cool side effect by giving your full attention to that thought by observing describing by doing this objectively as we've practiced in our preliminary exercises this is where you come back to the preliminary exercises without judgment or opinion you have put that thought on the foreground of your interpersonal space thus fading out the other streams of thought that are as wanted in the background of your mind doing their own thing and so the chaos becomes little by little it organizes itself it becomes more organized once you have given every ounce of your attention to that thought the vibration or the meditation object you've chosen 
will just come back naturally, bringing you back on the path to an automated self-transcendence journey. When you leave the sticky thought, you can give it some gratitude, some love, like a good night kiss to your child. You know, that kiss where you pray the Lord with all your might, even if you don't believe in God, you, ju you just pray with any prayer that you might have had heard at some point that your child will not wake up again. You know, I'm a new parent, so these analogies come naturally to me at this moment. But, you know, this is a really, really important part. Kissing the sticky thought goodnight, trying not to wake it up, you know, so with precaution. Now, two things might happen, and both of these things are totally okay. Option one, you look at your clock and you see that 10 minutes went by, so you still have some time to continue meditation, and that's that's good, that's okay. So you just continue for another 10-ish minutes, right? Option two, you look at your clock and notice that meditation is over. You know, you did 20 minutes or something. At that point, a lot of my students tell me, I did the meditation again because of a sticky thought. And I would suggest or advise, but again, it's your life, your experience, but I would recommend that you don't do that. If the meditation session is over, it's over. It is time for you to get off your meditation pillow and go live your best life. Remember that meditation is not Olympic sport. It is a practice to be a better human being, to live with a good soul, always in service of the people that we love and the people we don't know, in service to the world, no matter your work, your calling, your purpose, your duty. And so if the clock tells you time's up, don't think that you missed your meditation session because that sticky thought ruined it. Again, that would be a judgment. That creates a stinky mind. Say thank you for the experience, for the challenge, for the opportunity to take this challenge with grace, with sophistication, and move on. Your next meditation is either later today or tomorrow, first thing. Anyway, don't let thoughts ruin your meditation. Thoughts are your meditation. And so maybe you think that you didn't go deep or you, you were thinking about this thought or this and that. But that's exactly what it is. Sometimes you do this. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you react this way. Sometimes you react that way. That also That's also what makes, makes the whole process kind of fun, right? You don't know what to expect. And some days there'll be these sticky thoughts. And maybe there's one sticky thought. Maybe there's two sticky thoughts. Maybe there's a million sticky thoughts. And we could write the sticky, <laughs> the sticky thoughts song. Really hard to say. But again... I want to say that again. Don't let thoughts ruin your meditations. Thoughts are your meditation. Now, there's one last thing that I want to address here. I have, in, I have enough experience with meditation students to know that at least half of you will say something like, but I meditate to get peace of mind, to get inner peace. If I focus on that thought and that thought happens to be a negative thought, then my peace is perturbed and I have a bad day after that. And the goal is that I want to have a deep meditation with the sound because this is what feels good. Again, this is all judgmental. This is all engaging the ego, the judgments, the opinions. It is all about going back to an experience that you've had in the past with that sound, going deep, feeling this, feeling that. And my answer is very simple. And I'm sorry if I'm being a little bit too straightforward here, but that reasoning would imply that you're a victim of your own thought. We've all been there, so there's no shame in there, but this is there's some work to do here. We should not be victims, slaves to our own thoughts. Again, thoughts are not real. It doesn't even matter if it is the worst thought possible. A thought of pain and grief and suffering. You have the choice, you have the ability, you have the freedom, the last freedom, Viktor Frankl said, to step in and realize that this thought is just a thought. And even if it pains you, you realize that judging that thought will bring you more pain. If it is a very heavy thought, you'll come back to it. That's okay. You might need to get your pen and paper out and journal for about an hour. That's also okay. It might be that you need to talk to your coach or your therapist or your friend or your parent. There are a multitude of possibilities. I'm not saying that you're weak for being a victim of your sticky thoughts. Again, that would be another judgment. That would be another thought. Maybe it's a bit, maybe it's a very heavy thought and it takes a lot of work. 
but that's okay. You have to start somewhere. Wait, what movie? I think it's either Mary Poppins or The Sound of Music. The beginning is always the good place to start. Something like that. The beginning is always good. You have to start somewhere. The uh, the well, to get up the on top of the mountain. It starts with one footstep, with one with one step. Right. You're creating a space of calm and stillness to continue your work, to continue your exploration on that thought and maybe it will trigger some other experience if it is grief then notice that this is indeed a process of your grief and the, and there is no goal of not feeling the grief it's about dealing with the grief there's no goal of not feeling fear it's about dealing facing the fear and of course it can take days weeks months or years if you think that you can do better than the best you can that's a problem. You have another issue to deal with here. Of course, we can always improve. We can always grow. We can always push our boundaries. We move forward. But that is also a process that takes time. It takes stillness. It takes calm. At least to, you know, to go the right way. There's a quote I like, and I forget who said it now. I'll try to find it because it's a really, really good quote, and I use it quite a lot of times. And she says... When I fight against reality, I lose, but only, only 100% of the time. There's a great work of acceptance and letting go that happens during our meditation process. And so, give yourself some self-compassion, some gratitude, some appreciation from yourself to yourself for doing that work, taking the time, sitting down, breathing, humming, chanting, loving, smiling, crying, laughing, being in your most natural way as the you that you respect, as the you that you trust, the real you, 